So now we're going to look at Hamlet Act 2, Scene 2, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, and the actors. So once again, we're using the parallel text. So there is um, Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's original language on the, and modern American English on the right. And what, we've, what we see right off the bat is Claudius talking with Gertrude. Okay, now there are other people in the room here. It says that um, we have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and some attendants. When the king and queen start talking at the beginning of the scene, they're actually talking to this Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And those are uh, two new important characters that we should get familiar with. And they have an odd position in the story since they are um, they're friends of Hamlet's from childhood, but they're not being Hamlet's friends. They are instead working for the king and queen. They're basically deceiving uh, Hamlet uh, from the beginning. And they're close friends when they, when they were children. So it's sort of mm, love gone bad, if you will. It is the the love of friendship that is not important instead rosencrantz and guildenstern are doing what the king and queen want and are planning to benefit from that okay so as we start the scene um claudius is is talking to these two guys and he says basically that um hamlet has been acting sad and uh, he's gone through a transformation he's depressed and sad and so the king entreats them he asks them um, if they could vouchsafe their rest in our court some little time so by their companies they can draw him to pleasures and gather uh, what whether ought to us unknown afflicts him thus now in simple terms, we want you to stay here, and we want you to hang out with Hamlet and try and figure out what's wrong with him, figure out what's afflicting him thus. And Gertrude says that he has talked about you a lot, um, you're friends of his, and so we hope that you'll be able to um, use that friendship to figure out what's wrong with him. Okay. Now, bottom of the page here, it says, your visitation will receive such thanks as fits a king's remembrance. Um, your help, your, your visiting and helping us with this, will receive thanks from us. Well, what kind of thanks do you think the king and queen will give them? Um, probably a bunch of money, right? Maybe a title, who knows, I don't know. But they'll give, they're going to give them a king's level of thank you. In Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, uh, they humbly say that you don't need to pay us. What they say is that you have the sovereign power to command us to do this. And Guildenstern says, but we will obey. Okay, we'll do what you want. And Claudius says, thank you. Gertrude says, thank you. And then they send him off send them off to find where Hamlet is. They say, some you people go take these people to where Hamlet is. And then Polonius walks in. Now, Polonius has a couple of different items that he wants to cover. He says, first of all, the ambassadors from Norway have returned. And then he says, also, I have found the cause of Hamlet's lunacy. Two things that I want to cover. But, um... First, let's do the ambassadors. Let's take care of that. Now, the important thing is at the bottom, when uh, Polonius leaves, Claudius talks to his wife. He talks to Hamlet's mother, and he says, Gertrude, my dear, uh, Polonius says that he has found the source of your son's distemper. Notice it's your son who's depressed and a problem. And Gertrude says, I bet it's just 
just what? It is just his father's death and our over-hasty marriage. I'm sure that's what it is. It's just what you would expect it to be. Now, it is, that, that is exactly what it is, right? But it is important, I think, to see that Gertrude is, is bringing this up as a mother. Um, she is saying something that is sincere. She is, um, she's being accurate. She is understanding her son, okay? So what that really means is Gertrude is not evil, okay? Gertrude is, she's not what we would call innocent or holy, but she's not evil, okay? And that's important because, remember the ghost said, don't kill your mother. He said, don't imagine that you need to punish your mother. Let heaven take care of her. As if to say that she's less guilty than Claudius. Here's proof of that right here. Okay? Now, uh, Polonius comes back in with the people that were sent off to Norway. Remember, they were actually sent to Norway, uh, Voldemand and, uh, and Cornelius. They were sent to Norway in the first... Uh, first act. Uh, that was one of the first things that Claudius talked about. I'm going to send these guys to go and see if um, if we can fend off this attack from Fort and Braz. Okay. Now, what they say is you know, outlined here. They say, yes, when we got there, we talked to the to Norway. Norway is the name of the king. It's you know the kingdom of Norway. Fort and Braz what is the original old Fortinbras was Norway's brother. Now, are Norway and Fortinbras two separate kingdoms? Uh, I don't know. That's a little political. We won't get into that. We won't bother. What we will say is that Fortinbras, now young Fortinbras, wants his father's lands back. And Norway, the older king, king of Norway, is the one that has all of the resources to accomplish this, okay? And when Voldemond, uh, he says, what we told, we told this to Norway, and he said, oh, I thought my nephew's levies, his um, taxes and his gathering an army, it appeared to me, says Norway, that it was against the Polak. That would be me. Uh, that it was against the against Poland, that he was gathering an army to invade Poland. But we made it clear that it was against you, against Denmark, your highness, that he was planning on attacking. Okay? Now, at this point, Norway, Norway does not want to have uh, bad relations with Denmark, this, this king, Norway. And so he tells his nephew, stop it. You're not going to invade Denmark, but it's important to notice, um, to notice how he says it here. Okay. Because there's a, some wording here that will throw you off and will make you, uh, you'll make mistakes if you, if you miss this wording. So Norway sends out arrests on Fortinbras. He sends out messages that say stop. Okay, um, when you think of arresting, like arrested development, or if you're arresting a process, you're stopping it, okay? He sends out arrest. He does not arrest Fortinbras. He does not place him under arrest, okay? Make sure you do not ever mistake that, okay? Fortinbras is not arrested. He's not a criminal. He was told to stop. Okay? So, that is important to remember. Now, uh, when uh, Fortinbras says, okay, I will never more um, give the assay of arms against Denmark, if, you, if that's what you want, I will never do that again. I won't attack or fight Denmark, I swear it. Then what Norway does 
uh, sort of as a reward for this, he says, okay, so here's some money, and you already have these soldiers gathered up together, so, and I thought you were going to attack Poland, so why don't you go attack Poland, okay? So basically Norway says, go and do what I thought you were going to do. That's okay with me. But Poland, if you recall, Denmark uh, sticks up into the North Sea, Norway sticks down, and Poland is actually over here, okay? It's sort of below and to the east of Denmark. So if you're coming from Norway, the easiest way to get there would be to walk through Denmark, okay? And that's what, um, and that's what Norway is asking uh, Claudius for. He says, uh, I, I'm letting uh, Fortinbras attack Poland, so will you please give quiet pass through your dominion for this enterprise? Could my nephew, who recently wanted to attack you, walk through your country with all of his armies and go to Poland? Okay? Claudius says, huh. I like that idea. That's I like it likes me well. Uh, I think that'll work. Now we'll take care of it later. He says later on we'll read and we'll take care of this business. We'll labor over it. But for now, yes, thank you for your report. Okay, and those two guys leave. Now the reason this is important is because Fortinbras is no longer an enemy. Okay. Now, this is, it seems like a, an insignificant thing, or it seems subtle the way it's presented. But um, why was it that a couple of the people that saw the ghost of dead King Hamlet, why did they think he was uh, at the castle? Why did they think he was there? He's wearing his armor. And he is the guy who killed Fortinbras's dad. Oh yeah, he knows about the invasion. He's anxious. He's hanging out here to help Denmark with the invasion somehow. That's this is his this is his reason according to a couple of people why the ghost is even there. It's not Hamlet's reason. Hamlet thinks that um that his father is hanging around because somebody killed him. And then he hears the ghost tell him that, and it is Claudius. We'll find out later. Claudius did do this. This isn't a lie. But this concern right here, this attack, is no longer a problem. So, it'll come up again. Okay, I just want to make it clear. They're not attacking. Polonius even says, super, this is done with. That's great. Okay, even Polonius understands it. But he says, okay, now, now let's get to part two, which is, your noble son is mad. Uh, he's simply mad. But uh, I don't want to waste your time talking about it, he says. Um, I'm not going to... Uh, well, let me rephrase this. He, he is... Uh, very wordy when he talks. And Gertrude says, do you uh, get to the point, will you? More matter, less art. And Polonius says, oh, I'm not using any art. I'm just telling you the truth. It's, your son is mad, and it's a pity that he's mad, and being mad is a pity, and he's babbling on. Okay, uh, We should find out the cause of this effect. Actually, it's not really an effect. It's a defect, being mad. Okay, he rambles. He does this sort of goofiness. Now, that's moderately useful for us to know. Remember, he babbled to his son Laertes. And he, it, what it reinforces is that he's not wise and he's not respectful. No, they're not respectful. That's because of the way he treats his kids. But he's not wise. He's not a noble person. He's not a positive person. We have no reason to respect him. Not even his work, because he's a babbling fool. Now, 
when, uh, as he's uh, telling this, he says, I'm, I'm going to show you something. This is the, the letter that he's going to start reading. I'm going to show you something that explains why Hamlet is mad. He starts reading this love letter. Gertrude says, that come from him? And Polonius says, just wait a minute, I'll tell you. But the answer is yes. Um, and I want to look just a little bit at this, at this uh, love letter, this little bit of the love letter anyway. Because one of the things that happens in Shakespeare's language, Shakespeare's language has changed, uh, or English has changed between Shakespeare's time and ours. And one good example of that is the word doubt, because doubt nowadays means to have skepticism, to not necessarily believe. And in Shakespeare's time, it meant that sometimes, and other times it meant to believe with all your heart. So basically it meant to believe and to doubt both. Okay, doubt the way we mean it. Um, and that's a complicated thing. You should be able to tell by context perhaps, right? But in this letter, thinking from the context is ambiguous. And that's the way Hamlet talks. Hamlet has been doing these double meanings from the beginning of the play. And he does it here too. Look what he says. Doubt thou that the stars are fire. Well, they are fire. Doubt that the sun doth move. Well, the sun moves through the sky, technically. It isn't moving, but it moves across the sky. Doubt truth to be a liar. Hmm. That's a little bit conflicting. But then he says, never doubt I love. So you can, let's look at this both ways. You can not necessarily believe that the stars are fire. You can doubt that. You can even doubt that the sun moves through the sky. You can doubt that. Then this one is actually reversed. You can believe that truth is actually a liar. Okay. Because the only way that makes sense is if doubt changes its meaning there. You can disbelieve this. You can disbelieve this. And you can even believe this contradiction, but never doubt I love. Okay, so now which one is it? Is he saying here, never believe that I love you? Or is he saying, never disbelieve, never doubt the fact that I love you? Okay, it, it's an, and it's, it's ambiguous. It goes both ways. You can believe that the stars are fire. You can believe the sun moves. You know, these are truths. You can even not believe that the truth is a lie. But never believe that I love you. Or never not believe that I love you. So, so this ambiguity, this is important because later on he actually talks to Ophelia about his love. So, and Polonius doesn't, he just, he says, oh, here's proof, right? But what does it prove? We aren't sure what it proves. Incidentally, um, their interpretation of it, I mean, the way they say it, you may wonder, you may wonder, you may wonder, but never wonder wonder and doubt i mean they're sort of similar it's it's a fine translation but it's y you you lose if you see here's a perfect example if you look at the shakespearean language you realize that these words are ambiguous you realize that the uncertainty of this passage is based in the language itself Okay, when you look at the translation, all of that uncertainty, all that ambiguity disappears. Just saying. That's the reason, that's one of the reasons why I prefer to deal with the original language. But when they say, um, uh, Claudia says, how has she received this love? Um, Polonius says, what do you think of me? 
Well, uh, uh, Polonius, I wasn't asking about you. I was asking about your daughter. Well, I am the most important person in my family, so... Right, you get that? The selfishness? Let's see what he really means here. He says, uh, he says, King, what would you think, what might you think, if I had seen this hot love on the wing, if I had seen my daughter being pursued by Hamlet, or seen, you know, this uh, affair beginning, and looked upon it with idle sight, or looked the other way, I winked at it, or, you know, nodded, you know, and didn't put a stop to it. What would you think of me? What might you think of me? Again, he's the important one. So he says, no, no, I, I went to work and I stopped it. I said, you can't, you can't see uh, Hamlet anymore. This must not be. I prescripted, I, I told her, forbade her. I gave her instructions, prescriptions to not deal with Hamlet anymore. And she did it. She, she stopped seeing Hamlet. I believe her. And, uh, and, and Claudia says, do you think that this is what is really messing with his head? Uh, he actually asks his wife. And Gertrude says, probably. And Polonius says, is there ever a time when I have given you advice and I've been wrong? Um, not that I know. Of course, I've only been the king for, you know, couple of months here but uh, no as far as I know you're a, a reliable dependable guy um, we don't know if he's a reliable or dependable guy at work but he he had the ear of the king before he worked for the other king he works for this king so I don't know we'll give him the benefit of the doubt the point is that he's using his reputation to reinforce his idea that this is why Hamlet is uh, is going mad. Okay, now he says, "You know, King." He, he I'll, I'll explain this because this always comes up. Somebody always asks about it. It's sort of a interesting line. He says, "Take this from this, if this be otherwise. Uh, take my head from my shoulders, if this is not. If this case is different." If I'm actually giving you the the, uh, the false, you know, a false fact. If I'm actually lying or inadvertently lying, take my head off of my shoulders. Take this from this. Okay, that's what that means. But more importantly, you know, he just says, "Chop my head off if you don't believe me," or if I'm wrong. But he says, "If circumstances lead me, if I had the opportunity." I can find where truth is hid, even if it's hid in the very center of the situation. Okay? Polonius says, or, or Claudius says, how could you figure that out? Polonius says, well, I got a plan. I will loose my daughter to him. You know, he, as he walks, he walks around here in the lobby, just wandering around. He, he hangs out here, Hamlet does. And Gertrude says, yes. Polonius says, I will loose my daughter to him. I will send my daughter out there as bait. Okay? I will, I will use my daughter. Okay? I will uh, treat her like a tool. Okay? I will use her to reach our goals. Mm. It's your daughter, dude. Well, that's his thing. He says, I will put my daughter out here in the, the lobby area, and you and I, King, you and I, we will hide behind an heiress. An heiress is the tapestries that hang on the wall in a castle. Think about a castle. They've got really tall ceilings, you know, the old, old stone castles, and this is a medieval castle that they're in originally. Um old stone, thick stone walls, and tall, tall ceilings. And what they would do to keep it from echoing and to cut down on the, the breezes, you know, cut down the wind whipping around the walls and stuff, and, uh, and to give it a little bit of uh, 
heat, I guess, you know, it, maybe it would help the heating, but it would definitely cut down the echoing and the, and the wind is they would hang these huge tapestries on the wall. You've seen them in movies and things where big colorful tapestries, those are called heiress, um, heiresses. It's called an heiress. Okay. So we'll stand behind the curtains basically. I mean, that's almost a literal, def literal, uh, translation. So we'll stand there and we'll mark the encounter. Mark means listen. We'll listen in and we will, uh, we'll spy on him while he's talking with my daughter. She'll be the bait. He'll talk with her. We'll listen and we'll figure it out. Okay. And Claudia says, we will try it, but not right now. Hamlet's coming in right now. Well, now is not the time. We don't have anything arranged. So, so Gertrude says, oh, he's reading a book. Polonia says, get out of here. Go. Give me leave. You know, go away from me. Give me the opportunity to talk with him. And so they, they head out. They run away. So how are you doing, Hamlet? And he starts a conversation. Now the conversing that we see here, the conversation between Hamlet and Polonius, um, Hamlet is... Uh, as I've said before, he's into wordplay, he's into puns, he's into double meanings. Uh, and it's not necessarily for fun all the time because he he makes wordplays when he's talking to the ghost or when he's talking about his dead father, you know. Um, but he's messing with language all the time. That's, remember, he wrote the letter that said, doubt that the sun is, or doubt the stars are fire, doubt the sun moves. And we don't know for sure what he meant because he was using words that are intentionally ambiguous. And now here he is using a bunch of double meanings when he's talking with uh, Polonius, whom he can't particularly like. He's got, uh, he does, he, there's no reason for him to respect him either. So he starts out, uh, Polonius says, how are you doing? Hamlet says, I'm doing fine. Uh, you're a fishmonger, aren't you? And Polonius thinks, no, I'm the chief of staff. I'm the Lord Chamberlain. Why are you calling me a fishmonger? You're crazy. That's what he thinks. But what he says out loud is, no, I'm not a fishmonger. And Hamlet says, well, I wish you were so honest a man. I wish you were as honest as a fishmonger. Okay, what do you mean, Hamlet? Uh, well, a fishmonger is a, a person who sells fish in the market. Okay, in the in the marketplace, it is also a medieval term for a pimp, a pimp of prostitutes, is a fishmonger. Okay, and so Hamlet says you are a pimp, and Polonius, not knowing that that's what he says, says no, I'm not a pimp, but he's saying no, I don't sell fish, and ha Hamlet says, well, I wish you were as honest as a fishmonger. I wish you were so honest a man. Now. If you think about it, uh, a fishmonger, a market person, has to be honest. I mean, that's the way they do business. But he's also saying, "I wish you were as uh, I wish you were honest enough to admit that this is what you did, that you're a pimp, or I wish you were as honest as a pimp." Either way, it's an insult, right? Now, why is he calling him a pimp in the first place? Well. It seems to me that um, Polonius is going to use his daughter as a tool or as bait to trick Hamlet into spilling his guts. So we, the audience, we know that uh, Polonius is a bit of a, he is like selling his daughter. And he already talked to her like as if she was a prostitute. He says, you better not sell yourself so cheap or you're going to make me look bad. Now, if you think about it, you sell yourself cheap to somebody and I look like I can't raise my daughter. Or also, if you, the prostitute, sell yourself cheap, people are going to think that I, the pimp, am a cheap businessman, right? So it ruins my reputation in both cases. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of multiple levels that Hamlet is always speaking on. But let's uh, let's see what else he says. He says, um, 
To be honest in this world is to be one man out of 10,000. There aren't many honest men. Yep. And then he says, so you have a daughter, right? He says, if the son breed maggots and a dead dog being a good kissing carrion. Yep, you have a daughter, don't you? He pauses here. Now, this statement, we aren't exactly sure where he's going with this because he takes another direction right away, okay? Something about, about honesty and truth and a dead dog laying on the road. You know, you, a, a dead dog can't be much more honest than it is. It's laying there and it's dead. You know, there's no, there is no hiding the truth, okay? Uh, that's part of the way that this fits in with what he's talking about up, up above, the way he's talking about being honest. But the turn is actually much more impressive because... Um, one of the ways you know the dog is dead is because the sun is putting maggots in it. What? No, maggots come from flies. Yes, but in medieval times, they figured. They didn't know the flies were, you know, laying eggs, producing maggots. They thought if a dead thing lays in the sun, then the maggots automatically appear. It's spontaneous generation, they called it. Um, and so he says, the sun being out in the sun makes the dog full of this new life. Let's be clear. The sun, being out in the sun, fills the dog with new life. Okay. Um, okay, so where does this go? Hamlet says, so you got a daughter, right? Polonius says, yep. Hamlet says, don't let her walk in the sun, out in the sun, in the sun. Okay, in the sun is actually a figure of speech. It means outside, okay? Like, and you'll see another phrase they use later is uh, in the, out of the air, but we'll get to that. Uh, walking outside, walking in the sun. Don't let her go out alone. Don't let her just wander in the sun, which would be, you know, being alone outside. Um, because what will happen if you let her go out in the sun. Same thing as that dog. Conception is a blessing, but as your daughter may conceive, friend, look to it, don't let her go walk out in the sun alone. Don't leave her to her own devices. Don't let her out of your sight. Don't let her alone. Because if she's out in the sun, which is a figure of speech, she might suddenly find herself full of new life. Yeah, you leave her alone, she's going to get pregnant. So it's a, it's a, and, and, and Polonius, it goes right over his head. He doesn't see this at all. It's a very um, a closely engineered statement, but Polonius doesn't realize it at all. He says, huh, how say you that? What the heck are you talking about? Blah, blah, blah. First he says I'm a fishmonger, and now he's, huh, he's crazy. Well. Wow. He's acting crazy, he's acting mad, he's put on an antic disposition, I'll grant you that. But, the conversation goes on. Uh, an important thing, I guess, before the conversation goes on, this is still Polonius talking, and he's saying, in my youth, I suffered much extremity for love, very near this. I know that this is because he's in love. This is this is love craziness. And I know because I have been there. This has happened to me before. Okay. Um, and then he goes on. He says, uh, what are you reading, Hamlet? Uh, he says, oh, words. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, what is the matter that you're reading? Oh, nothing. He says, nothing is the matter. He says, no, I mean what you're reading. Oh, it's just slanderous. And then he's he, another like word game here he says um basically what i'm reading is that it says that old men are weak and old and they're you know they it's all these little things that go wrong with old men um their beards are gray their faces are wrinkled their eyes are full, are sappy and you know all this kind of stuff and here's an important another important turn of phrase he says i most powerfully and potently believe this I, Hamlet, think that's all true. Old men are 
gross and disgusting, but I hold it not honesty to have it thus set down. I don't think it's honest to say it, okay? I don't think it's honest to write it down. Well, remember he said earlier, the ghost is an honest ghost. So he's using honest in a specific way here. Honest doesn't mean true. It means proper, holy, righteous. It's not good to say that old men are falling apart and, and busted down, even though they are. It's not right to say that. And we know what he thinks a right thing is. The ghost is right. The ghost is proper and holy and righteous. Okay. Um, another figure of speech here. Here it is. Polonius says, well, well, first he says, although this seems like madness, there seems to be a method in it. There's method in his madness. He's, it's almost like he's making this stuff up. It's almost like he's uh, telling, like he's saying things that are supposed to sound crazy but aren't. Mm, yeah, he is. That is what he's doing. Because that's what he said he was going to do. We'll take him at his word. Then we have this question. Will you walk out of the air, my lord? Out of the air is means literally out into the air. Okay, They're in the castle. And he's saying, this is another figure of speech. Are you going outside? Okay. Now, if we think, well, why does he say it that way? That's weird. Well, how about outdoors? Okay. You want to go outdoors? Um, yeah, I go outdoors. I go indoors. Um, you know, it depends on where I'm going. Well, no, outdoors means outside. Why do you say outdoors? It's sort of weird. Or even outside. There's the out, I suppose the outside of the wall, but like the other side of that wall is the outside of the wall that I'm looking at. That's like what? And it's still in the building. So figures of speech are just like that. Out of the air is just an old way of saying outside. Okay? So are you going to walk outside? Now, it has to be written this way. Again, this is a language thing. Because if he says, are you going out of the air, then what's the opposite of going, what is, if he's going out of the air, what's he going into? He's going into something that has no air. Right? Only if it's phrased this way. So, when Polonius says, are you going out of the air? Hamlet says, um what, like into my grave where there's no air? Is that what you mean? Out of the air, into the ground. That doesn't make any sense in modern English, okay? You can go outside, into my grave. That's not, that's not, it's not there, right? Anyway, so, and Polonius says, yeah, that is going out of the air. I get that, you know, I get the pun. But now Hamlet says, into my grave. Why? What is he thinking? I, well, he's thinking of suicide. He was thinking that earlier. When he, his funny, you know, idea, yeah, I'm going into my grave. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, I, he wants to kill himself. Ha, ha, ha. And we see that because of this figure of speech. And... It comes up again here, and this one's even a little more complicated, so I just want to make it nice and clear for you. Um, uh, Polonius says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave him. I'm going to go into the castle. And he says, my honorable lord, I will most humbly take my leave of you, which means I would like to ask you if I could leave your presence. I will take from you my presence, and I will go away. Now, taking my leave... If you think of it, it, literally, it's like you're allowing me to have my leaving of you. Okay, you're letting me be absent from you. Okay, so I ask if I can take my leave. And Hamlet's response is, you cannot take from me something that I will more willingly part with all, which means to give you can't take from me something that I want to give you. Okay? Um, just 
for the moment, think of it as uh, you left a job. So when you left a job, either you quit or you got fired. If they're going to fire you, you can say, you can't fire me because I quit. So now you can't fire me because I already quit. Or if they say, we're firing you so that you can't quit. Okay, it's the difference between quit and fire. That's take and give, right? He says, you can't take it from me if I'm giving it to you. You can't, and the thing that's, that he's asking for is me going away from you, Hamlet. And Hamlet says, oh, you can ask to take that from me, but I want to give it to you. I want to give you the opportunity to leave. Please get out of here. Go now. Okay, he's, he's saying, you can't you know, take from me the, your absence. I've, uh, please, get out of here. I'm giving it to you. Okay? That's what this means. But there is one thing that I would like to give up that I can't give up. Okay? I want to part with something, and I can, you can't take it from me if I want to part with it. However, there's one thing that I do want to part from and nobody will take it from me, and that is my life. I would like to take my life or give up my life, but no one will take it from me, okay? So take or give, because we both, we use both terms okay in modern English I give up my life I you know die or if I take my own life I die so here again he's talking about suicide and Polonius just sort of blows it off he says okay I'm, I'm leaving bye and he sees Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and he says you're looking for Hamlet there he is he's right over there up there somewhere so that's where we stop for now